talk is very long, so I'm going to go very fast. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But. Um, so the idea behind probabilistic topic models is that as we, as more information is available to us, we need new tools, new statistical tools, and new machine learning tools to help us organize, search, and understand, understand it. Um, and so what topic modeling provides are algorithmic methods for automatically organizing, understanding, helping us search and summarize large electronic archives of texts. And the idea is a three-step process. First, we discover the hidden themes that pervade a collection by analyzing the text themselves. Then we annotate the documents according to those themes and then find as though there were people annotating the documents and then finally we use those annotations to help us do whatever it is we want to do with our big collection of documents. So for example, with the topic model, we can analyze science. Sorry, with a topic model, we can analyze um, scientific articles and automatically learn groups of words that are associated together under a single theme, such as these, which we'll, we'll see again. Um, we can look at how those words change over time. For example, here are two discovered topics and particular terms in those topics and how they changed through the, uh, through the century. Um, we can discover how topics are connected to each other. So here we see a plot where um, you can see that this topic, these words are more associated with these words than they are in a document, for example, with words about genetics. Um, and all this, like I mentioned, can be used to help us get a handle on organizing a large archive of texts. So we work a lot with JSTOR, who have millions and millions of archived scientific articles that want to organize them in some kind of coherent thematic way. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to first give you a brief introduction to topic modeling, talk about some new models that uh, we've been working on in my research group, modeling topics through time, modeling the hidden impact that a document has on a long sequence of documents, and doing collaborative filtering with users and content using topic models. Um, and then I'd like to talk a bit about a new algorithm we've developed for doing scalable computation with, with topic modeling. Okay, so. The basic idea behind the simplest topic model, which is latent Dirichlet allocation, is that documents exhibit multiple topics. So here's an article called Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities from Science. And what I've done by hand is I've highlighted different words uh, with different colors. So words like predictions and analysis and computational, these words about data analysis are highlighted in blue. Words like genes and genomes and sequenced words about genetics are highlighted in yellow. And words like organisms and life and organism uh, and survive, words about evolutionary biology are highlighted in pink. So, um, you know, this is an article about determining the number of genes that an organism needs to survive in an evolutionary sense. And if I took the time to highlight every word in this article, and if you squinted, then you would see that this article kind of combines the themes of genetics, data analysis, and evolutionary biology. And so that's the intuition, that every document in our big collection of science articles exhibits multiple topics. There's some set of topics that describe the collection, and each article exhibits them with different proportion. So what we're going to do with this simple topic model is encode that intuition in a, in a generative probabilistic model. Um, and so here are the generative assumptions that latent theory allocation that LDA makes. Um, this is really, these are imaginary assumptions. This is just a way to articulate the particular statistical independence assumptions that we're making in our, our, in our model. So the idea now, I can define a topic for you formally, is that each topic is a distribution over terms in a vocabulary. So we have some vocabulary of 10,000 terms, and living outside the collection are these topics, each of which is a distribution over those terms. So you can see we have this distribution with words like data, number, and computer with high probability, this distribution with words like brain, neuron, and nerve with high probability, and so on. And let's say we have 100 of these. Now for each article, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first choose a distribution over these distributions. That's this cartoon histogram here with the pink bar and the yellow bar and the blue bar. And then for each word, I'm going to choose and again, I emphasize this is imaginary, I'm going to choose a, a coin from this distribution. So here I chose the blue coin. And then I'm going to look up the distribution over terms associated with the blue coin and choose a word here, analysis, from that distribution. Here I chose the yellow word, the yellow coin, and I chose the word genetic. Here I chose the blue coin, I chose the word predictions. I choose, choose the pink coin sometimes and choose words like life and organism. Okay, so the idea is that every document is generated in this way. And when I turn the page in science, I'm going to choose a new distribution over my topics. This one might contain, for example, the neuroscience topic, um, and then choose all the words from in, in the same way using that distribution over topics. Okay, but the problem, of course, is that in reality, 
we only observe the documents themselves. Our goal, our computational goal, is to um, reverse this generative process to figure out what is the structure that best describes this collection under these assumptions. Okay, and that's an inference problem. So the, um, the, the topics, the topic proportions, and the topic assignments, these are all hidden random variables. The observed random variable are the words of the collection, and um, our goal then is to compute the posterior distribution of the topics, the proportions, and the assignments given the documents. So we've turned the, our intuition about documents that they exhibit multiple topics into a generative probabilistic model with certain assumptions, and now we've cast the problem of analyzing the documents under the intuition that we had as a statistical inference problem of computing this posterior. Okay, so as a graphical model, when we work with probabilistic models, we often like to use graphical models because they give us a lever into the kinds of, uh, the kinds of algorithms that we need to compute with them. Um, as a graphical model, LDA looks like this. So here in a graphical model, just to remind you, nodes are random variables. Edges denote dependence between random variables. And um, observed variables are shaded. Uh, unshaded variables are, are hidden variables. So this is the model I just described for you as a graphical model. Um, oh, there's one other thing. Plates, these boxes, denote replication. Okay, so living at the outside, so this plate here, these are the topics of the collection. Each of these betas is one of those distributions over terms, like the evolutionary biology distribution and so on. Um, and so you see we have k topics living outside the collection. Then for each document in the collection, that's this d plate, we first choose, now, hold on one second. We first choose the uh, topic proportions, this is the distribution over topics that this document is going to exhibit. Then for each word in the document, we choose the topic assignment from those topic proportions, and then we choose the word from the corresponding topic distribution beta. Okay? Is that clear? So this is the, this is the same model that I described to you in that big cartoon figure, uh, succinctly described as a graphical model. <coughs> okay. Um, so let me show you how this works. Actually, one, one, one thing I want to emphasize, and it's made clear in this picture, I hope, is that um, so in, a, in, a, in LDA, the same set of topics describes the whole collection of documents, but each document exhibits those topics with different proportions. That's how this is capturing that intuition I showed you in the first slide. <coughs> okay, so we took the OCR collection of Science Magazine from 1990 to 2000. This is 17,000 documents with 11 million observed words, grouped by document, of course. And we used a vocabulary of 20,000 terms, where we removed stop words, words like and and of, and we re removed very rare words, words that only occurred in you know, five or 10 documents. Um, and we fit a 100 topic LDA model using variational inference. I'll get to that at the end of this talk, hopefully. Um, Right, okay. So we took all the documents, we said we want 100 topics, and we computed that posterior distribution I told you about, which is basically filling in the values of the hidden random variables. So here's that article again that I showed you before, and when we look at the, you know, the, the real histogram over topics, we get a picture like this. Okay, so just to be clear, I took my 17,000 articles, I fit a topic model and learned 100 topics from them, and now I'm estimating the conditional distribution of the topic proportions given the words of this article. Notice, for example, notice here that only a handful of the topics are somehow activated. Even though the model has access to all 100 topics, it's saying that only a few of them are being used uh, in this particular article. Okay, and then you can look at the top most frequent words from those most frequent topics here, and you can see that they correspond to our ideas of things like genetics, evolutionary biology, diseases and survival, and computer models. Okay, I want to emphasize here again that these notions are just emerging from looking at word co-occurrence statistics. That nothing about the, the model or the algorithms uh, gave gave us the idea that there's something called genetics living in this corpus. If we applied it to um, news articles, we'd get a totally different set of themes coming out of it. Okay, and, and again, all this can be used to build browsers that are thematically um, organized of collections that are otherwise disorganized, that we might not have time to organize. Okay, so 
LDA can visualize the hidden thematic structure of large corpora, generalize new data to fit into that structure. Really, this builds on latent semantic indexing and probabilistic latent semantic indexing. In a sense, this is a Bayesian version of probabilistic latent semantic indexing. Um, and in statistics, models like this are called mixed membership models. These are models where um, each data point exhibits multiple components with different proportion as opposed to a single component like you find in a mixture model. Um, Okay, so LDA, since um, we worked on it, has been used and, and adapted in, in many different settings. Um, and the reason, trying to talk a little bit more about some big picture things here, is that organizing and finding patterns in data has become extremely important in a lot of, in a lot of places. And models like LDA can easily be embedded in more complicated models. I'm about to show you some examples of that. Um, algorithmic improvements, at the end of the talk I'll show you, I'll tell you about an algorithmic improvement let us fit these models to massive data. This need really requires that we have algorithmic improvements to fit models like these to very large data sets. Okay, and, and the bigger picture here is that this is just a case study in doing probabilistic modeling on text data. And, you know, one kind of caricature of probabilistic modeling looks like this, where we have our data, we make assumptions about the data that we encode in some kind of graphical model. Then our data and our assumptions combine into, we, we combine our data and assumptions into an inference algorithm to approximate that posterior distribution that we care about. And then finally, we use the results of that inference algorithm to do whatever it is we want to do. Explore data, make a prediction, do nothing. All those are available to us. Um, and so, you know, this is like a recipe for data analysis. These things are all linked, but we can work on each piece separately. So I'm going to tell you next about three ways that we've changed these assumptions about uh, that LDA makes to adapt to different kinds of data sets. And then I'll tell you about a general way to improve inference in LDA and other graphical models. <clears throat> okay, so the first assumption that we can relax is the assumption that the topics are static. The, the model I just described for you assumes that there's one set of topics and it describes the entire collection of documents. It makes this latent assumption that the documents are exchangeable. It doesn't matter which document we saw first and which document we saw last. But if we're going to analyze things like Science Magazine that spans you know, 120 years, then it might not seem reasonable to say that the same topics in 1880 are the topics that we're going to find in 2010. And to deal with this, we developed the dynamic topic model. This is where um, topics drift through time. and Rather than a topic being represented as a single distribution over terms, it's now represented as a sequence of distributions over terms. Okay, so here's, here's the graphical model for the dynamic topic model, um, and I'll just kind of give you an intuitive explanation of this picture. Each vertical slice of hidden and observed nodes um, is a year, okay, let's take science as an example, is a year in science, and here is 1880 when science was founded, and there are K topics in 1880. Okay, and, and we use those same assumptions I just described for you to generate all the documents of 1880. Then we march forward to 1881. The topic distributions drift a little bit between 1880 and 1881, and now I'm going to generate all the documents in 1881. And now I march forward to 1882 and so on until I get to the present day. Okay, so that's the generative process that the dynamic topic model assumes. And so when we analyze data with this, we get a retrospective estimate of the topics that describe the collection under the assumptions that the topics are going to drift through time from 1880 to the present. Okay, again, we're, gonna, we're still going to, here I've just played with the graphical model, we're still going to have to use an inference algorithm to compute the conditional distribution of all the hidden variables, the unshaded nodes, given the observed variables. Okay, we can play the same game we played before. Here's an article called Sequencing the Genome Fast. This is about uh, the technology needed to sequence the genome. It's really all in the title, Sequence the Genome Fast. And again, um, only a handful of the topics are activated here. So now we're not analyzing just a decade of science. We're analyzing 120 years of science. It's something like 160,000 articles. And, um, and there are 50 topics in this model. And again, only a handful of the topics are activated. And again, I can look at the most frequent words in those estimated topics. And these are words about genetics words about data science and information, and words about devices and technology, okay? But now, remember this model, that, that topic about devices and technology is sitting here in 2001 when that article was um, written, 
but it's part of a topic that's been drifting since 1880. So we can look at what that topic looks like every 10 years, and we see a different, a different kind of summary of this data. Here is the topic devices, materials, gate, current technology, and so on. And if we look at this topic back in 1880, it has words like electric, machine, power, engine, steam, iron, battery, and it, it drifts forward slowly. In the 20s, it's about tubes. In the 60s, it's still about tubes and chambers. Um, and in the 70s, heat, power, and then 2000 devices and silicon and technology. So again, I emphasize that this, the notion that there was something that drifted from electricity to silicon is not built into the model. It comes out of running an inference algorithm on appropriate assumptions um, that we're making about the data. So we took this dynamic topic model and we asked, and we, we asked the question, can we use something like this to identify influential articles. Okay, so here's the, the hypothesis is that, let's say in the history of science, Einstein uh, develops a theory of relativity and I develop a crackpot theory that uh, is incorrect. Okay? Yeah. Very conceivable that that could have happened. Um, looking forward in time, you would see lots of scholarly work building on Einstein's theory of relativity and Intuitively, we should be able to retrospectively decide that this, this paper written, whatever it was written, is, had a large impact on the future of science, and that my paper had no impact at all, right? Because nobody wrote papers about my crackpot theory later on. Everyone wrote papers about Einstein's theory of relativity. We want to do this without reference to citation, because we're imagining that we can use this kind of thing on corpora where there are no citations. So our hypothesis is that influential articles reflect future changes in language use. And we're going to use, again, a probabilistic model built on the dynamic topic model to measure this. We're going to model the influence of an article as a hidden random variable and posit that influential articles affect how those topics drift from year to year. Again, the posterior is going to give us this estimate of which articles are influential. Yeah? Would it help or make it more it would probably help. It would also make things much more complex. Yeah, um, but that's something that you know we want to work on, and some people have worked on first steps towards that as well. Um, so here's you know here you can see the so kind of blessing and curse of graphical models, right? So um, I took that same model, I added some some nodes, you know, here's uh, oh, sorry some edges. So um, here, instead of topics drifting with basically mean zero from year one to year two, now the way they drift depends on the words of the documents written in year one. And moreover, they depend on this ID variable, which is the hidden impact of each article. Okay, so an article that has a high ID means that when I go from beta one to beta two, I'm gonna use the words that that article wrote down in science, and my crackpot theory is going to have a very small value of ID, so when I go from beta 1 to beta 2, it's going to ignore my theory. Um, I say blessing and curse because, you know, this took us like five seconds to write on the whiteboard, and then, you know, one to two years to figure out how to compute with a model like this. It's very complicated. But happily, we were able to compute with it. And again, when we compute the posterior distribution, the conditional distribution of all the latent variables given the observations, we get posterior distributions of those impact variables. And it turns out that those, I mean, happily, it turns out that those correlate with real, with real measurements of impact, in particular with citation counts. Okay, so for example, um, we looked at three corpora. For example, on the ACL corpora, we got a very high correlation to citation count, almost 35%. And this is not using any citations at all. So just to be clear, we're taking the sequence of articles that, we, uh, that, that, are, that were written about computational linguistics. We're not looking at who cites who or how many times anything's been cited. And we're just using the text of the articles. And we're, under those assumptions that I just described for you, we're computing the posterior estimate of the impact of each article on the future. And that posterior estimate has significant correlation with real citation counts. So for example, in, in natural language processing, you might know there was a real revolution in, um, in, with statistical natural language processing. And one of the earliest papers about that, uh, that, that 
um, that began that revolution is the mathematics of statistical machine translation, Brown et al. 1993, and we correctly identify this as being a, a very high impact paper. Um, but we make mistakes too, kind of interesting mistakes. So the most cited paper in the computational linguistics corpus that we have is this paper, Building a Large Annotated Corpus of English, the Penn Tree Bank. So if you're, if you're familiar with NLP, you know that this paper basically introduced a, a very well curated data set of, of parsed sentences and articles um, that has been used over and over again and analyzed by many papers subsequently. Um, this paper had a lot of impact, but it's not the kind of impact that we can detect because future articles didn't use the language of this paper, they used and, and analyze the data set that this paper contributed. So it, it, it kind of finds a different type of, of impact than citation counts might find. Okay. Um, Pin tree bank, wouldn't then those words appear? Pin those words might appear, but re remember we're looking at this at the topic level, so just using the words pen tree bank, unless we had a topic about the pen tree bank, which we didn't, it's not going to identify that as being a huge factor in determining the influence. I want to emphasize that this paper had a huge influence. I'm not taking away from its importance here. Just these are different measures of, of impact. Yeah. Um, oh, 10 minutes, that's great. Um, okay, so uh, the next uh, variant of these assumptions that I want to talk about is using topic models to do recommendation. Um, so here it's, it's a different idea. Here we are taking online communities of scientists who uh, basically upload their BibTeX files um, so that everybody can share their BibTeX files um, and you get a sense of, of which papers each scientist likes. So these communities have been emerging, things like um, Cite You Like and Mendeley. And this is an opportunity to recommend scientific articles to other scientists based both on what they liked, the classical collaborative filtering problem, and the content of the articles, right? Because, you know, unlike Amazon, where I want to be recommended a book that other people uh, that like the same books that I liked also liked, um, here when a new article is published, we want to be able to recommend that article to other scientists before anybody has rated it. We want to, it's, I think it's called the cold start recommendation problem. And, um, with the topic model I'm about to show you, we can form both in-matrix and out-of-matrix predictions. What does that mean? Well, here is an example. Um, the EM paper at the top there, we can predict who's going to like the EM paper based on the content of the EM paper and which other people like the EM paper. Um, but if there was a new paper, say about what I'm about to tell you about, that no one else had, that no one had read yet, we could also make predictions about who might want to read that paper with the same model. And as a byproduct of this, if a paper is very sparsely read, we can use the content more to make predictions than a paper that's widely read, where we have a good idea of who might like that paper. Oh, oh five minutes. Ah, well. <laughs> I will skip the graphical model in that case. Um, and yeah, so here's the punchline, since there's only five minutes. The punchline is, what we do is, we have, we use topics again. Each user in the system is represented with a vector of topic interests, and each paper is of course represented with a vector of topic proportions based on the words of the paper. But then we have an additional vector for each paper, which, is, which also has the dimensionality equal to the number of topics, which we call the topic corrections vector. And that says, okay, this paper might be about one thing, but people that like this other thing also tend to like this paper. And that topic corrections paper if you look at the graphical model, which I was going to skip, um, it becomes influenced by the votes that people make about each paper. And so as more and more people vote about the paper, we get a better sense of what topics, what, of, of which topics that people are interested in will, I don't even know how to form a sentence about this. As more people rate the paper, we get a sense of who, of which topics are interested in the paper, and we have a sense of which topics people are interested in, so it gives us a better sense of how to predict who will be interested about the paper. Good. And um, yeah, so here, is an, here are some results on, on doing both out of matrix prediction. Here's prediction on papers where we don't know uh, anything about, about how people rate the papers. And here is prediction where we know something about how people rate the papers. Now the, 
the blue line is using only the content. Okay, this is like saying, I know how people are rating papers, but I'm going to ignore it. And I'm just going to use the content of the papers to predict how people are going to rate. And that does so well. The red line is classical collaborative filtering. This says, I'm going to ignore the content of the papers. I'm just going to use the matrix of who likes what. And notice that we do much better there than we do only using the content. The green line is using both the content and the other users. And we do somewhat better than using the users alone. Of course, the green line exists in both plots because the green line can, because the model I just showed you can do both out of matrix and in matrix prediction. Okay, and there's other ways of, of adjusting the assumptions of topic modeling um, to accommodate different kinds of data, different kinds of um, limitations of that simplest model that I described for you. Okay, so finally, I want to briefly tell you about an innovation in, in inference mainly how to scale up inference. So all the models that I described for you operate in the same way, where we, have, we, we formulate our assumptions about the data, and then we want to estimate the posterior distribution of these hidden variables given the observations. And the way we do this is by using an algorithm called variational inference, which is typically a batch algorithm, OK? The idea is step one, analyze all, step one, hypothesize an estimate of your posterior. Step two, analyze all your documents under that estimate, which is garbage. And then step three, update that estimate a little bit. This is a batch algorithm and it's very inefficient. With online algorithms, what we can do is sample a single document, analyze that document, update our idea of the model, and repeat that process. And it's much more efficient because we don't waste our time analyzing the entire corpus under garbage assumptions in the very beginning. We only analyze one document and then immediately make improvements. Okay. I'm going to skip how it works. Well, I'll tell you how it works here. Um, what we do is we randomly pick a document. We do a little local computation on that document alone. We then pretend that that document is the only document we've ever seen in the collection, and we compute topics based only on that document. And then we update our global topics to be a weighted average of these fake topics computed only on that document and our current idea of what those global topics are, and then we repeat. So at any set point in the algorithm, we have a set of global topics, and we randomly pick a document, analyze it, and then adjust the global topics based on that, based on that, um, on that document. Here's why we want to do this. So in the y-axis, I have perplexity, where lower numbers are better. This is a measure of how well our model is fitting our data. And in the x-axis, I see how many documents I've seen, or how many documents have I computed about. In typical topic modeling algorithms, we're analyzing here Wikipedia. Let's say we wanted to analyze 100,000 articles in Wikipedia. We don't get an estimate of how good the model is until we've analyzed 100,000 articles. Okay, that's batch variational inference with Wikipedia on 100,000 articles. And moving forward, we get better and better estimates of, um, of the model. But with online learning, as soon as you've seen one article, you have a model. And you can see that when we get to the place where we, would, where we get our first estimate with batch learning, we have a much better model. And then the other line, the green line, is fitting Wikipedia to 3.5 million articles, which you really can't do in a reasonable amount of time with batch learning. So, there's a paper about this if you're interested, or you can talk to me afterwards. I can tell you the stuff that I skipped. Basically, the reason it works is that we're doing stochastic optimization on the variational objective function. OK, and the reason I'm telling you about it is that this, I think, is a very promising algorithm. Stochastic variational methods are a general way to approximate this posterior distribution, which is the, the key to going from assumptions to data analysis. Um, and lets us apply graphical models like the ones I've showed you to much more, much larger data sets. And there's some software and papers about this on my website. Okay, so in summary, hierarchical Bayesian models of text are a powerful way to explore and summarize large archives of documents. In general, probabilistic models give us an intuitive language for expressing assumptions about observed and hidden variables. And algorithmic advances like online inference let us compute with these assumptions on massive data sets. <clears throat> Some open problems that I'm interested in are things like model diagnostics and model checking. When we're, when we're fitting statistical models um, 
for the purpose of exploring data, how can we decide which model is the model we want to we want to look at? Looking at things like classification error and, and held out accuracy don't really um, cut it in the in those settings. Incorporating linguistic structure into topic models. So these topic models ignore linguistic structure, and it would be interesting to think about how to um, use what we know about language to inform the models themselves. Um, looking at interfaces and visualizations of topic models and theoretical understandings of variational inference. So I didn't get to talk much about it, but there is no theoretical understanding of the inference algorithm that I showed you. Um, it's it's principled in the sense that we're minimizing a KL divergence between the true posterior and, and an approximate posterior, but how that um, approximation behaves, for example, in the case when we have a lot of data, um, is, is really unknown and not, not worked on much. Thank you. Yes, I do. So let me go back to that picture. Right, so um, certainly you need domain expertise to work here, right? Uh, I, I don't work here without working with someone with domain expertise on whatever it is we're working on. Um, and there are, it's, it's kind of like anything, there are very general purpose ways of doing inference here. So you're probably familiar with Gibbs sampling, um, and there are good packages where you basically draw your graphical model and then get a Gibbs sampler out. Um, and there's a trade-off always that um, uh, the, more, the more work you put into specializing your inference algorithm for your problem, the better inference will get, will, will be. Um, but I would start with using those general purpose tools. It's, it's not really much motivation to work on inference until you realize that you have a problem. This online variational inference stuff is semi-automatic in the sense that if your model has certain properties, um, namely that every pair of variables is conjugate to each other and you can write down every conditional distribution, then you could immediately write down the online algorithm and code it up. So um, I hope that answers your question. Um, I guess I have two questions. One, no. by the way, this is just a, a nice clear talk. Thank you. Um, one, in the middle, talking about your latent variables, which were labeled topics. Yeah. Um, it, it seemed like you were speaking as if topics had meaning outside of the model. They don't. And that was one question I was Yeah. So no, this is like factor analysis. We don't want to, if I, if I had longer than half an hour, I would have been very cautious. But I had to go fast. That, that was the one. And then the other one was I'm just wondering, so if you're showing a certain kind of success, and I'm just wondering if simpler models would have shown. I didn't. I, I don't see a comparison to potentially simpler models. Ah, uh, yeah. And, and I'm just wondering, in, in maybe in the paper that you published or something like this, do you have comparison against simpler baseline systems? That we do. Yeah. So in all in all the work that I presented, um, in the recommendation paper, it's of course the classical collaborative filtering, or simple content-based collaborative filtering. Um, in LDA itself, we compare to things like LSI and PLSI. Actually, not LSI, it's harder to do that, but PLSI. Um, and in the influence paper, we kind of devised a number of simple baselines that still capture some, some of the statistical signal about what papers have impact, but not quite as much as this type of model does. Although in that setting, I think it's just interesting to, to see that we can get something out of language, no matter how you get it. Okay, so, so I wanted to find out more about that. Yeah, we'll look at the papers. Yeah. 